Now, we are going to be having some fun tonight because you're going to be able to participate in this as well. So if you have a smartphone with you, go ahead and take it out and go to pollev.com slash Texas Tech. That is just the name they gave me. You don't have to enter your name. It'll ask, but you don't have to. If you have a computer, you can also do it that way. And if you are listening online, you can do it too, because it doesn't matter where you are. So go to pollev.com slash Texas Tech, and here is your first test. Are you a undergraduate student attending this talk or listening in? Are you a graduate student? Are you faculty or research staff? Or are you a community member? Isn't this cool? You can see it updating as you answer. Yes. All right, so so far the undergraduates are winning the day. I suspect there may be a bit of a sample bias because you're probably the ones with the phones that will do this. I have a feeling there may be some people who don't have phones who can do this or didn't bring them. But we have, okay, so we've got about 60% undergrads, we've got about 12% graduate students, 20% faculty and staff, and nine or 10% community members. Fantastic. All right, so now you know how this works. So talking climate. Today, it's hard not to talk climate. If you look at headlines we've seen over the last two years, destructive impacts of hurricanes remain months after they've occurred in Texas, in Puerto Rico. A year ago, last December, the Thomas Fire became the largest wildfire on record in California. It burned the greatest area on record that record was broken in the summer and it was smashed in the fall. Three record-breaking fires in less than a year. What other headlines do we see around the world? Catastrophic damage to coral reefs, extreme weather, a third of Bangladesh was underwater. As the Prime Minister of Dominica said when he spoke to the United Nations after his island state had been decimated by one of the hurricanes in the season last year, he said, to deny climate change is to deny a truth that we have just lived. So it's hard not to talk climate change because we are starting to see the impacts all around us. It isn't about future generations anymore. It isn't about what's happening far away. We're starting to see the headlines. We're even starting to see the impacts with our own eyes. So this brings me to my second question to you. And this time, don't pick a letter, actually type a word. What impact of climate change are you personally most concerned about? Now, this is anonymous. You can answer whatever you want. What impact are you most concerned about that you've experienced personally, that you've seen happen? The bigger words are the ones where more people respond. Isn't, isn't that cool? All right, I, was, I would say you're, you're covering the gamut here. So we have sea level rise. That is a huge one, and flooding. We also have extreme heat, health, migration, unrest, dislocation. I like the dogs. Where did the dogs go? I saw that. <laughs> Humanity, children, poverty, conflict. There's not just one thing, is there? There's dozens of reasons why we care about a changing climate. It isn't just about what happens to you if you live in New Jersey or Florida or an island in the Caribbean or the Arctic. Whoever we are, wherever we are, we are witnessing the impacts of a changing climate. So when we see people saying things like, the debate over global warming is far from settled, or for everyone who thinks it's warming, I can find someone who thinks it isn't, or Alarmist theories on climate science originate with scientists who operate outside the principles of the scientific method. Or when we simply see polling data like this. This is polling data from this year. It asks people, do you think global warming is mostly caused by human activities? Across the United States, these are the results by county. It's from the Yale Program on Climate Communication. You can zoom into individual counties or even individual congressional districts if you're interested. Anything that is orange is more than 50%. Anything that's blue is less than 50%. 
So we look at this and we think to ourselves, surely if they just knew the facts, they'd change their minds, right? This is one of the cartoons from our little series called Global Weirding. It's a PBS digital series, it's on YouTube. It's super short, five or six minute videos. We have more than 30 of them that answer frequently asked questions. This one is our second most watched episode. If they just knew the facts, they'd change their mind, right? Well, this is why we have social science. I'm a physical scientist, I study the physical world, but social scientists study us. And social scientists have studied questions like this. One of the scientists who studied this is Dan Cahan from Yale. You'll notice I like to show you pictures of the different researchers so you can see who they are. And in a Nature paper he published back more than five years ago, he said, public apathy over climate change is often attributed to a deficit in comprehension. People don't know enough science. If they don't know enough science, then what should our response be? Well, the original IPCC reports that were first published in 1990 got out of date pretty quickly, so you should write a few more of them. And then we need another full set by 1995, and then those are out of date within a few more years as well, and then we have another set and another, and they're actually working on the next set right now. Well, maybe those are international reports, so we need another national climate assessment. We just finished publishing the fourth national climate assessment. At this point, it's gone from a 100-page document to over 2,000 pages. Or we could have National Academy of Science reports. You get the picture here, right? How did that study conclude? We tested this and we found no support. In fact, and this is a bit of a shocker, People with the highest degree of science literacy were not most concerned, they were what? Most polarized. And in subsequent research, they've gone on to find that the smarter we are, the better we are at cherry picking the data points we need to support our pre-existing opinions. Another study that Larry Hamilton from the University of New Hampshire did in New Hampshire he asked people, do you think climate change is happening now caused mainly by human activities? And then he asked them what political party they felt like they were most affiliated or registered with. And then he asked them, how much education do you have? So people who had some high school were pretty close together. Some university started to diverge. University graduates, further apart, Postgraduate you get education furthest apart of any. So he independently verified this exact same thing. The higher people's level of education, the more up farther apart they were on climate change. And when we look at this, our response is often something like this, <laughs> right? Because we're at a university. Isn't the university all about educating people? And you're saying education doesn't work. In fact, maybe you're suggesting we should not educate people? No, no, education is good. But if this doesn't work, how do we talk about climate change? The first thing we need to do is don't fall for the smoke screens. If you're familiar with the story of Don Quixote, Don Quixote traveled around Spain tilting at windmills. What did he accomplish by tilting at windmills? Not very much. When we engage with the smoke screens that people throw up to hide their real objections to climate change, when we simply engage with the smoke screens, we are tilting at windmills. What do these smoke screens look like? Well, get your phone out. I'll give you a few of them. You can tell me which one is the most popular one that you've heard the most. What is one of the most common science-y sounding smoke screens that you have heard? It's just a natural cycle. It's not happening at all. In fact, sea level's falling. It's not rising. Somebody on Twitter told me the other day, sea level lies. <laughs> that was some extreme personification of sea level. <laughs> Scientists are making it up, or we don't know because we haven't studied it long enough. Or of course the favorite between November and April, it's cold outside. All right. Okay, you guys are right in line with my experience. I track this data. I get anywhere from two to three people a day to a dozen people a day, usually on social media, but I also get letters, I also get emails, I also get messages. And by far, the number one thing I hear is the top one, it's just a natural cycle. Now elsewhere, including in one of our Global Weirding episodes called It's Just a Natural Cycle, Isn't It? We talk about this. 
And what many people don't realize is the very people who study climate change are the same people who study natural cycles. So we've studied natural cycles, volcanoes, changes in energy from the sun, even unknown factors and how they could possibly be contributing to a changing climate. And every single one of these has an alibi. And if you want more information on that, check out the global weirding episode. It's just a natural cycle, isn't it? But to continue, we hear this stuff all the time. We hear it from people we know, we hear it on social media, and as just one man said to me the other day, perhaps Miss Climate Genius can explain how we had an ice age despite zero human interference or emissions contributing towards that change. And of course my response to that was, it's Mrs. Climate Genius, thank you very much. <laughs> the reality is, is that climate science is very old. We have known that trace levels of heat trapping gases in the atmosphere are keeping our planet almost 60 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than it should be otherwise since the 1800s. In the mid 1850s, two scientists independently, John Tyndall in England and Eunice Foote in the United States, independently identified carbon dioxide and methane as two of those gases. And, uh, and Tyndale even went further and connected the fact that methane is produced during coal mining and that humans are increasing emissions of heat trapping gases in the 1850s. By the 1890s, the science was sufficiently advanced that Arrhenius, who was a physical chemist who won the Nobel Prize for his work in physical chemistry, on the weekends he was looking for something to do, so he decided to calculate by hand the very first climate model. It was an energy balanced climate model that calculated how much the world would warm if we doubled or tripled levels of CO2 in the atmosphere, and he even calculated how much more the Arctic would warm than the rest of the Earth in the 1890s. And then by the 1930s, Guy Callender, who was a British engineer, in his spare time, people seemed to have a lot of spare time before the internet, in his spare time, he rode around the world and he collected weather station data from all around the world and he calculated global average temperature. And he showed as early as the 1930s that it was ticking slowly and relentlessly upward. And he wrote a paper that was published in 1930, I think it was 37, and it could have been 38. And in it, I love reading that paper because he basically says, you aren't going to believe what I have to say, but, and he talked about how burning fossil fuels was causing the planet to warm in the 1930s. Some people might say, well, it's just that this is so complicated, you know? How can we explain this in simple terms? Well, I'm going to show you how you can explain it in simple terms using a 60-second cartoon. Here we go. Our planet, there's our happy planet, has a natural blanket of heat trapping gases. The sun's energy shines down and warms the planet and the planet gives off heat energy. But that heat energy is trapped by the blanket. Not all of it escapes back to space and that is what keeps our planet habitable for life. We would not be living on a frozen ball of ice if it were not for this incredible natural blanket. So what's the problem if it's natural? The problem is, is that by digging up and burning increasing amounts of coal and gas and oil, we are wrapping an extra blanket around the planet. And just like when I used to go stay at my grandma's house when I was little, and she would sneak in every night, true story, and put an extra blanket on me because she was afraid I would freeze. Yes, we did have central heating in Canada. And I would wake up sweating, saying, Grandma, I didn't need that blanket. In the same way, we're wrapping an extra blanket around our planet that it does not need, and that's why it's running a fever. If we truly had a problem with the science of climate change, we would also have a problem with basic fluid dynamics. We would have a problem with basic thermodynamics. We would have a problem with the exact same science that explains how our stoves and fridges and airplanes work. And granted, you can find a website that says almost anything. So there may be a website out there saying that refrigerators are part of a communist plot. But most of us would agree that those are not legitimate arguments. People do not truly have a problem with the basic fundamental physics. 
Well, you may be saying, oh, I know what they have a problem with. Because we hear this from our politicians as well. Climate change is not a science, it is a religion. And I already have a religion that says, bring on the end times, or people have dominion over the earth, or my favorite, the Bible said there will always be seasons, therefore the planet cannot be warming. Uh, God is in control, not humans, or of course, you godless liberal atheists. As Lindsey Graham said, the problem, of course, it's not us. The problem is that Al Gore has turned this thing into a religion. And on the internet, there is proof of that. Here is the proof. <laughs> and you may notice that someone has photoshopped my head onto the choir. <laughs> so then you may say, let's get the Pope to set them straight, right? Now, this is actually our most popular global reading episode. I had no idea. I was really surprised. It's actually called, What Does the Bible Say About Climate Change? This is the one that the most people have watched. And it's absolutely true. You can get a religious leader in almost every single faith tradition who has stood up and said really good things about climate change. You can find the Orthodox Patriarch, you can find Evangelical leaders, you can find Muslim leaders, you can find Jewish leaders, you can find leaders across the whole spectrum. The Pope is just one example. And of course he wrote a whole book called an encyclical, and in that book he said many things, including this global warming is caused by the enormous consumption of some wealthy nations, has repercussions on the poorest places of the planet, that's why we care, true. So then you look at the survey data. And if you look at all Americans in the top, and they're asking how worried or how concerned are you about a changing climate, and then you break it out by religious affiliation or denomination, the most concerned people group in the country are Hispanic Catholics. So you might say, okay, the Pope, right? Well, let me fill in the rest of the data here. People in the front who have good eyesight, who are the least concerned people? White Catholics, yes. You might say, oh, what, what is going on here? Well, enter the social science. This is my, my colleague, Ashley Landrum. She studied the effect of the Pope's encyclical. And what she found was, she found that when we encounter new information, we interpret it through our prior beliefs and relevant social identities. And what she found is that for people who previously agreed with what the Pope said, the encyclical raised their opinion of the Pope. They thought better of the Pope, not just Catholics, but Protestants and non-religious people too. But if people disagreed with the Pope, their opinion of him actually decreased after the encyclical. Why? Because what drives their identity was not their religion. People don't really have a problem with either the science or religious objections because every major world religion has at its core tenets of stewardship or taking care or responsibility for nature and also the sense that we are to care for people who are less fortunate than us. And those are the only two values we need to be at the front of the line when it comes to caring about climate change. So John Evans broke this out in a bit more detail. He said it's true that he was looking specifically at conservative Protestants here. It's true that conservative Protestants are less likely to believe the conclusiveness of climate science. However, he said when you control for demographic properties, it's not, and he said, engaging in fundamentalist discourse. I said, okay, good. Just, let's just call that going to church. <laughs> he said it's not going to church that causes this effect. Opinions are rooted in age, conservatism, and in the United States, which political party we're affiliated with. So rather than engaging with the smoke screens, what are the smoke screens? The smoke screens are sciency sounding objections and religious -y sounding objections. Those are the smoke screens. Rather than engaging with the smoke screens, we need to confront the real problems. And the real problems begin here. This is from the Pew Political, Political Polarization Survey back in 1994. I'm not going to survey the room to ask who was alive then because that would be a depressing response, given the percentage of undergraduates here. 
<laughs> but before you all were born and when the rest of us were still here, the world looked very different. This is what the political landscape of the United States looked like. Democrats and Republicans were pretty close together in the middle. Most people were in the middle and just a few people were out at the edges. And now let's step through time. They didn't do this every year, but they did it enough years so you'll get an idea of where this is going. Ready? Try not to blink. Here we go. 1994, 2011, 2015, 2017, and then, this is the entire population, but in 2017, they also looked at just people who had actually voted in the last election. These are the voters. We live in a world where rather than 90% of us being in the middle, now 80% of us live at the edges. What does this have to do with our opinions on climate change? It turns out it has pretty much everything to do with them. Because in the United States today, the best predictor of whether we agree climate is changing, humans are responsible, the impacts are serious, and we need to act, is not how much we know about the science, it's not where we do or don't go to church, it is simply where we fall on the political spectrum. So one of the true most dangerous myths that we have bought into is that we have to be a certain type of person to care about this. And even more dangerously, many of us have concluded I am not that type of person. But let's take a step back for a second. Does a thermometer give us a different answer depending on how we vote? It shouldn't. Do you get to live on a different planet? depending on the choices we make politically. No, they're not taking us to Mars no matter how we vote. And honestly, I'd rather not go there. <laughs> so in the words of Galen Carey, who works for the National Association of Evangelicals in DC, he said something which I think is absolutely accurate. He said, many evangelicals, and you could really just replace this with many conservatives, oppose action to slow climate change, but they don't do so on a religious basis. And again, I would add they don't do so on a scientific basis either. It's political because they believe the government wants to take away their freedom. And honestly, if you believed, be honest, if you believed the government wanted to take away your freedom, would you say yes? That's about the most un-American thing I've heard of. I'm not even American. And then, I think this quote is really stunning. This is from the man who brought the snowball onto the floor of the Senate and said, here's a snowball, therefore the planet can't be warming. He said, do you realize, I was, he was speaking to Rachel Maddow here, he said, do you realize I was actually on your side of this issue when I first chaired the Senate Environment Committee and I heard about this? I was on your side when? Until what? I was on your side until I found out how much it would cost. So people do believe that what? That the solutions pose an imminent threat. That the solutions will take away our freedom that the solutions will destroy the economy, that the solutions will take us back to the Stone Age when we lived in caves, that the solutions fight against everything that the War of Independence was for, government control, unfair taxation, or you know that climate change will lead to the mark of the beast as well. I get a few of those. And again, be honest with yourself. If we are talking about the government controlling your individual personal decisions, setting your thermostat and telling you what type of car you can or cannot drive, if we're talking about destroying the economy, returning to the Stone Age, imposing massive widespread unfair taxation and letting a remote government control your choices, I know this sounds a bit redundant, but it's kind of going through it, would you be in support of those solutions? So have a little sympathy, because if that's what we believe the solutions are, why would we want solutions, right? This is really important, because you know what? That's a good reason. It's a good reason, and it gets even worse than that. We believe, and when I say we, I don't mean all of us, but many of us believe that the solutions pose an imminent threat to our way of life. And what else do we believe? And when I say we here, I really do mean most of us. We also believe the impacts do not. Let me illustrate this. 
When you ask people, and this is the map I showed you before, do you think global warming is caused mostly by human activities? You see some, some orange and some blue. But when you ask people, do you think it's happening? The answer is heck yes. The country is pretty much entirely orange. I can only see one county that is not orange. Then, okay, watch this. Then you say, do you think global warming will harm plants and animals? Why would that county be orange now if they don't think it's real? That's the interesting thing about polling data. Do you think global warming will harm future generations? Almost identical, yes. Do you think global warming will harm people in developing countries? Mostly, mostly yes. Do you think global warming is already harming people in the U.S. now or in the next decade? Oh, and there's one more. Do you think global warming will harm you personally? This is the problem. The problem is not whether we agree with 200, 2,000 pages of science in the National Climate Assessment. The problem is that even when we say, oh yes, we absolutely agree, we don't think it matters to us. Now, you see those couple of orange counties? What people group lives in those orange counties? Exactly. <laughs> yes, so we can even see it in this data. Why is that? It's because if you're making a movie about climate change or global warming, if you're writing a book about global warming, what do you put on the cover? Now, be honest here. I'm not going to poll you. I'm just going to ask you for your hand. Who has seen a polar bear in the wild with their own eyeballs? Okay, we have a room full of many scientists and we have five hands. Three of them in the front two rows. If the number one symbol of this issue is an animal that we have never seen, and we're told that the impacts include destroying the economy and letting the government control our personal choices, do you really want to fix this thing? I would personally say no. When we do see pictures of people that are being affected, predominantly those pictures are of people who live far away. And so when I wrote about this for Foreign Policy magazine last year, I, they asked me to write an essay on the real problem, and so I did. I said the real problem is we don't think it matters. They picked the cover. And you know what they picked for the cover? They picked a picture of an iceberg with people on it. I was like, yes, this is exactly it. We are on this tiny, minuscule planet floating in outer space. It is the only home we have, and it is crumbling under our feet, not literally, but in its ability to support our lives. So the first most dangerous myth we've bought into is that I'm just not that type of person. And the second one we bought into is climate change is a distant issue that it only affects future generations or people who, or animals or plants who live far away. So this brings us to the last question. What can we do about it? Now, I was asked recently, well, if you had to do a TED Talk, what would you do it on? So I thought to myself, well, if I had to do a TED Talk, I would do it on the most important thing we can do. And they're like, oh, you really want to do a whole TED talk on light bulbs? <laughs> and I was like, no. I really think the most important thing that we can do is talk about it. Why? I have the data to show you. This is what the data looks like. So remember, I just showed you that really dark blue map about um, do you think global warming will harm you personally, right? This is not the bluest map. I have one more. Here it is. Do you discuss global warming at least occasionally? That's the darkest blue map there is. So let's connect the dots here. If we never talk about something, why would we care about it? Right? If we don't care about it, why would we want to act on it? So action begins with the conversation because if you don't talk about it, why are you ever going to do anything about it? It's very rare for us as individuals, let alone as a society, to do something we haven't talked about first. So that is why talking about it is so important. But you may ask, is there any way to have a civil and positive conversation? And 
I answered yes with an asterisk here. Because too often we feel like, oops, there's my asterisk. Too often we feel like our conversation sort of looks like this. Susie the scientist shows up with all our data and facts and charts and figures. And Calvin feels threatened because he feels like she's telling him that he has to give up who he is to accept the solutions. The conversations might end something like this. Or, if we're perfectly honest, they might end something like this. So how do we have these conversations? And before we go there, let me ask you another question. Who would you like to have a climate conversation with that went well? Sky's the limit here. Who would you like to talk with? Your mom, your boyfriend, Trump, president, students, mayor, husband. Donors, yep. Roommate. Yeah, <laughs> I'm seeing one word emerge here. <laughs> I love this. This is great. So look at all the different names here. Some of these people are um, well-known names, famous figures, politicians. Some of them are people who we know intimately, our mother, our brother-in-law, our roommate. We all have people in our lives that we want to have this conversation with. And that's what I want to talk about with you now. Because if it really is so important to have that conversation without it ending something like this or something like this, how can we do it? How can we have a conversation that is relevant so people understand that it means something to their lives, that is current, that is constructive, and honestly, I think the last one is the most important, hopeful. How can we have a hopeful conversation? Before I begin that, I want to explain the asterisk here, though. The Six Americas of Global Warming is a study that polls people across the United States year after year, and rather than putting them just into yes, no categories, puts them into a spectrum of people. There's people who are alarmed, people who are concerned, then you have people who are cautious, then you have the actually the smaller groups, people who are disengaged or doubtful or dismissive. Now, these numbers here are from 2016. The latest numbers just came out this past January, and we now have record number of people in the alarmed and concerned group. 59% of the country is alarmed or concerned now. Can we have constructive conversations? We can with all but one group. Dismissives are not a big group of people. They average about 10%. But people who are dismissive are the loudest voices. They dominate the comment section on any online article. They're quick to tag on to your Facebook post when you posted something about climate change. They're on Twitter and they follow climate scientists like me and they're constantly, you know, picking at us saying, oh, you can't say that or you can't show that or oh, Miss Climate Genius, yada, yada. People who are dismissive, my personal definition of dismissive is people who, if an angel from God bearing brand new tablets of stone saying global warming is real and foot high letters of flame appeared before them, they would still reject it. And if they would reject that, why would I expect them to accept what I have to say? Dismissive really is the best word because it characterizes what they do. And so when I encounter people in person or on social media, there's a test to tell if somebody's dismissive. The test is when they say, oh, well, it's just a natural cycle. And I say, that's a great question. Did you know that we've looked at it? Here is a resource, a video or an article that explains it. A dismissive person will not be able to bring themselves to click on the link. I've experimented a little bit. I've actually you know, asked them to do it multiple times, three, four times. I've said, do you have an issue? Is there a reason you can't click? You know, do you need some assistance? <laughs> what can I do to help you? They cannot bring themselves to click a link. In fact, it's amazing. I want a psychologist to actually study it. Why? It's because their personal identity, who they are, is built on and constructed on a set of beliefs that include absolutely rejecting the reality of a changing climate. 
So they cannot confront any information that might possibly um, counter that belief because they don't see it as a different, as an opinion, they see it as an attack on their identity, who they are as a person. It is really difficult to have a constructive conversation with somebody who's dismissive, and I typically don't because that conversation does not begin with respect. And if there is zero respect between people when having a conversation, it's really hard for that conversation to go anywhere. So I typically bow out. But we have 90% of the population left. And we absolutely can have constructive conversations. And this is the approach that I found that works. The first step, you might say, oh, the first step is I gotta go read that big climate report you keep talking about. I need more data and more information. I just don't feel like I know enough about this. I should have like a little set of like cue cards in my back pocket I can whip out with like global temperature on them. No, that's not the first step, relax, you're good. You have the first step nailed. Because the first step is to figure out what you have in common with the person or the people that you're talking about. If you don't know, ask them questions and get to know them. Figure out what makes them tick. What is it that they care about that you care about too? The most basic thing, of course, is we're both humans living on this planet. But there should be something else beyond that that we can identify with. Then we can explain, because of what we share, let me explain to you from the heart why I care about a changing climate because of this thing that we both care about or this value that we both share. And then this was the toughest for me as a scientist because as a scientist, we're, we're really good at diagnosing the problem. We can diagnose the problem to death, but we are not fixers. This is not what we do. But I have had to educate myself on solutions that I can at least share with people. I don't want to be prescriptive, but I do want to at least be able to share those solutions with people so they understand what type of different answers we're looking at. Because imagine this, imagine if you've been running a low grade fever and that fever went up and down from day to day, but week after week it climbed and inched its way higher. You finally went to the doctor and the doctor did all the tests. The doctor said, could it be the flu? Could it be food poisoning? Could it be leukemia? The doctor did all the tests, consulted with all of their colleagues, and then brought you back in and sat you down and said, okay, well, we've diagnosed what you have. Here's what you have. And then you said, okay, well, that sounds you know, pretty serious. And I said, yeah, it will be serious if you don't do something about it soon. And so then what's the most natural question next? What do I do? Imagine if the doctor just leans back, folds their arms, and be like, oh, I don't know. That's not what I do. No, we need hope, we need answers. We need at least like a pointing in the direction of where we would go to fix this problem. So let me give you a couple of specific examples so you can see what I'm talking about here. These are just examples because the answers to these questions are as diverse as the number of people there are in the room. Bonding. What values do we share? Do we hike? Do we bird? Do we have kids? Do we care about kids? Are we members of the Rotary Club? I am not a Rotarian, but, and I talk about this in my TED talk, the first time that I went to a Rotary Club, I walk in and there's this giant four foot banner staring me in the face, and I look at it and I think, this is climate change. Is it the truth? Yes. Is it fair? Absolutely not. It disproportionately affects the poorest and most vulnerable people in the world. Would it build goodwill and better friendships to address it? Yes, it would. Would it be beneficial to all concerned? Well, if we don't address it, no. If we do address it, yes. So I skipped the lunch buffet and I took my slides and I rearranged them into the four-way test as fast as I could. And I got up there and I gave the four-way test on climate change. And I could see the faces in the audience. This was West Texas business people. When I got up there on that stage, Half the faces were thinking, who invited her? And the other half of the faces were thinking, I know who invited her. <laughs> but by the end, those faces had changed because I had gone through their value system. And I will never forget the banker who came up at the end of my presentation with the most bemused look on his face you have ever seen. He said, you know, I wasn't sure about that whole global warming thing, but it passed the four-way test. <laughs> Like, what can I do? Why did that work? It was because that was his value system. And we're not usually as fortunate as having people print like a four-foot banner with their value system on it. <laughs> but 
but you know, we're all pretty social people. You can probably figure out at least one or two of people's values through conversation. And by framing it in terms of their values, it just completely opens the door. Because what are you doing? Number one, you're respecting their values. Number two, you're identifying with their values, so you are together rather than apart. And then number three, you're showing how this issue fits into their values, such that caring about it is not only a natural thing for them to do, being the person they already are, but caring about it makes them an even more, even more genuine version of who they are, because they are acting out their values and their beliefs even further. Think about that for a minute. There's many other values. I mentioned already the value of faith. Every major world tradition has in its core values that can be directly connected to a changing climate. So I spend a lot of time talking to faith communities and we've actually done some experiments. I have been the guinea pig in the experiments. Um, this is a recent study that was published a couple of months ago. Um, that is my dad there. He's a science educator and he has taken on some of this research with a few colleagues where they show a video of me giving a presentation to students at Christian colleges. And what this study found was really interesting. They found that they studied three Christian colleges where one was very conservative, one was kind of middle of the road, and one was quite neutral, politically. And they found that after watching a video where I kind of talked through, you know, how do we know this thing is real? How do we know it's us? Why does it matter? What can we do to fix it? there was statistically significant changes in their opinion. And the most conservative group increased the most. In fact, to within the statistical significance, they all increased to the same level. So this can happen. But when I was speaking at one of these colleges, um, uh, another scientist came up after my talk and introduced himself and said, you know, I don't work here at this college, but I've been trying to reach out to churches in my area. I live in a conservative part of the country and I've been trying to reach out to churches to talk to them about climate change. So, but he said, I can't get my foot in the door. How do you get your foot in the door? So I said, well, the best thing to do is to start with the denomination that you're affiliated with because you share the most with them. So I said, well, you know, what church or congregation do you go to? Oh, he said, I don't go to any, I'm an atheist. So I said, okay, well, then that's not where you want to be going because that is not the values you share. So we had a conversation about the community groups he was involved in, about the um, activities he was involved in, and we were able to identify groups where he was part of their value system and he was able to engage effectively. So there's no like, you know, magic one size fits all in this. It really depends on who you are. Then we can explain that we know it's real, it's us, and scientists agree. But it's even more important to explain how it's impacting our region, how it's affecting the ski season, or it's changing bird distributions, or it's making our cities hotter, or it's affecting our water resources. And this is a large part of what we talk about in the National Climate Assessment. So every chapter, this is the website where you can find it, every chapter talks about a different region of the United States. And then there's a chapter for every sector of the United States, water, transportation, cities, infrastructure. And what this shows us is that climate change is already affecting us in the places where we live. And within five or 10 minutes, you could probably find examples. The fact that for many small towns across the Northeast, high tide flooding, so not storm flooding, just high tide flooding, has increased by a factor of 10 or more over the last 50 years. The fact that in the United States there are already climate refugees, people who have to leave their homes and their land, because due to subsidence and sea level rise, they will be underwater. And these people happen to be a Native American tribe in Louisiana. We know that wildfires are a natural part of life in the United States, in the Western United States, but we also know that approximately double the area has been burned since the 1980s due to a changing climate. We know that up in Alaska, what used to be permanently frozen ground is thawing and crumbling under their feet, putting homes, buildings, transportation infrastructure, and even pipelines at risk. On the islands, many key sites from airports to historical monuments are built within just a foot or two of sea level. Even down in Texas, our droughts are getting stronger and longer. 
Hurricanes are dumping much more rainfall. Nearly 40% of the rainfall that fell during Hurricane Harvey is estimated to be enhanced by a warming climate. Uh, our number of days over 100 degrees is projected to increase significantly. The number one reason why we care about a changing climate is because it takes the naturally occurring weather and climate disasters that always happen. This is a map of the number of weather and climate disasters that have cost at least a billion dollars worth of damage since 1980. Texas is number one. Because we get everything. We get pretty much every type of disaster you can imagine. The only one we get is the type of disaster from mountain snow melting too fast and flooding because we don't have mountains. But we get everything else, even hail, even ice storms, blizzards. We care about a changing climate because it's loading the dice against us. We always have a chance of naturally rolling a double six. The set of dice for Texas has three sixes on it already naturally. But as climate changes decade by decade, more and more of these numbers on the dice are turning into sixes, and sometimes even the occasional seven, as climate change supercharges our extreme weather events. So it's important to connect it directly to the places where we live, but not just the places where we live. Because when you look around the entire world, people are being disproportionately affected in the poorest countries in the world. Climate change is a threat multiplier. It takes hunger and poverty, and disease, lack of access to clean water, even conflict and refugee crises. It takes these and it exacerbates them, it amplifies them, it makes them worse. So lastly, we have to talk solutions. What can we do to fix this thing? Are there positive solutions compatible with our values? There absolutely are. We can talk about individual solutions. Sure, we can talk about light bulbs, but we can also talk about eating lower down the food chain. Did you know that all the food tonight was vegetarian? Yes. We can talk about cool new technology like solar shingles and electric cars. We can talk about adaptation like the Netherlands where they're building floating villages. So what happens when sea level rises? You buy a few more feet of anchor chain. Or in Texas, they're replacing very wasteful pivot irrigation with in-ground irrigation that saves a ton more water and makes us more drought resilient at the same time. We can talk about energy solutions. I love these pictures because you wouldn't expect this, would you? You know how many permits you have to file to put solar panels in a thousand-year-old cathedral? A lot. They told me about it in detail. I like talking about what's happening in Texas. Yes, in Texas, the amount of wind and solar energy we have is climbing every year. 2018, 19.2% of our electricity on the Texas ERCOT grid was wind or solar. Fort Hood is the biggest army base in the US, and of course it's in Texas. But they went with wind and solar energy to save taxpayers over $150 million because it was cheaper than natural gas. There's entire towns going green. Dallas is already 100% clean energy for city operations. Dallas-Fort Worth Airport is the first carbon neutral airport in the, in the country, in North America, actually. Little town of Georgetown decided to go with clean energy because a couple of business students from the local college crunched the numbers and told them how much money they would save. Nothing wrong with that. We can talk about what agriculture is doing because a lot of the carbon footprint associated with agriculture comes out the rear end of cows. A lot of methane. Well, it turns out if you feed cows seaweed, a cheap farmer in eastern Canada found this out. He was feeding them seaweed that he collected along, along the coast. If you feed them seaweed, that almost completely cuts their methane emissions. That's pretty cool. There's also grazing practices that put carbon back in the soil. Agroforestry that puts carbon back in the biosphere again and boosts livelihoods. We can talk about what businesses are doing. And again, this is not prescriptive. These are examples of things that are already happening. The fact that the richest company in the world, which is Walmart, is going 50% clean energy by 2025. That's pretty good. Apple's number 11, they're already 100%. Morocco has the biggest solar farm in the world. The United Kingdom has the biggest offshore wind farm in the world. China has more wind and solar energy than any other country in the world. But I'm most excited about what's happening in places that don't have energy, places where kerosene is the only option. It's amazing to think of the fact that people's lives are able to be revolutionized by providing clean energy in unexpected places. I like telling people about initiatives like Project Drawdown that you can find online at drawdown.org. They, they list 100 possible solutions to climate change. And they're very unexpected. 
Now, number one is refrigerant management. Then you've got wind turbines, yes. But then number three is reducing food waste because we throw out about a third of the food that we buy without eating it. That's a pretty simple thing that we can each do and save money. Then you have my favorite number six, educating women and girls in developing countries. Investing in tropical forests, rooftop solar, regenerative agriculture, afforestation, tree intercropping, geothermal, nuclear, it's all there on this list. So let me ask you now, here's a question for you. Tell me honestly, what's the thing that really gets you excited? Something you've already heard or something that you heard today? What's your favorite solution? It can be a personal solution. It can be a policy solution, legislation. It can be a technological solution. It can be something that's kind of boring but really important like conservation, efficiency. All right, ooh, waste, food waste, educating women and girls, wind, eating differently, yes, conversations, sustainability, corporations. I love this. By the way, if you put like a, a little line between your words, they'll stay together. Sorry, I should have told you that earlier. We get the idea though, right? Very cool. So, do you have something that you can go away from here excited about? If you have something cool to talk about, that can be a conversation starter because that's something positive, like, hey, you wouldn't believe what I heard. And it's not anything about destroying the economy, it's not anything about the government telling us what to do. So how can we talk about climate change? By beginning the conversation where we most agree rather than where we most disagree, by explaining why it matters to us because of those shared values, and lastly, by finding ways that we can work together to act. Because in the words of one of my favorite scientists, Jane Goodall, it is only when our clever brain and our human heart work together in harmony that we can achieve our full potential. Thank you. Now, we're gonna do this also. Oh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, so uh, I guess we can do some questions, A couple of questions. this way. This way. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have about 20 minutes for questions, and it's our tradition here at Rutgers to start with student questions. Uh, so uh, if you have a question, uh, I would suggest if you're in the room, let's line up here you can save that for people on the internet. Well, I, th I, th I think I am going to go back okay. and forth. I'm going to do it 50-50 because I know some people, it's, it's hard to get up and go to a mic in front of a room full of people. So we're going to do it 50-50. So we're going to go question here, question there, and thank you, I'm fine. <laughs> All right, come on and line up if you want to ask it in person. But if you don't want to ask it in person, no worries. Just put it right up there. All right? And you can type a full sentence. It will appear as a full sentence. Go for it. What can us college students do to um, convince our more conservative friends and also be more sustainable ourselves? Great question. So, I think you probably know part of my answer to this. One of the most first and most important things we can do is talk about it. So, have those conversations with people. But don't just march in there with all the facts and the data. Have a conversation about something that matters to them. And have a conversation about something that they can do to help so that we feel like we can contribute to the solution in our individual lives, in our community, at the school, with our family, in another organization that we're part of. One of my students was part of the Outdoor Club. She calculated the carbon footprint of the Outdoor Club. She found that there was ways that they could reduce their carbon footprint, which was completely consistent with their values, right? Because they value the outdoors. So there are all kinds of things that you can do. Thank you. Great question. All right. So many good questions here, too. Um, let's see, uh, too many good questions. Um, oh, there's a couple of policy questions, so I'm gonna kill all of these with the same stone, so to speak. Um, we're often asked, as climate scientists, what do you think of a certain policy, or can you endorse a certain policy? As a scientist, I feel like it's very important for me personally to be policy agnostic. What do I want? I want a policy that works, that cuts carbon, that does not disproportionately affect the very people who are already bearing the burden of society's choices, and one that has broad support so it'll actually stay in place and won't get canned by the next administration. So that's what I want. Have I got it? No. 
I don't. The Green New Deal is the only deal on the table at this time that actually proposes the sweeping changes that we need to our society to wean ourselves off carbon long term. But there is a bill before the House right now that puts a price on carbon, and that's a good first step in that direction. Could it be cap and trade? It could. Could it be legislation? It could. Did you know there's libertarian solutions and there's free market solutions? I'm in favor of anything that actually works because right now we do not have anything. So we need something, and whatever works is going to help us fix this problem. Question from you. Hi, my name is Olivia Haller. I'm an environmental policy student at Rutgers. Um, you said that globally, um, people, poor nations are disproportionately affected by yes. climate change, um, which I agree with. But do mm -hmm. you think that globally, everyone, all the countries are <coughs> Yeah. Um, okay, I can hear you and I'll repeat it. Do I think that globally all countries are... All, all countries are, um, like, they experience the same type of um, weather disasters, but it's more difficult for poor nations to mitigate because of their, uh, because they're poor nations. Yes. That, so she asked if it's the case of, do we pretty much all experience disasters, but it's harder for poor nations? And the answer is absolutely yes. Let me give you an example. Hurricane Matthew, a couple of years ago, came through and hit the Carolinas. I think there was something like 30 deaths and quite a bit of damage. But Hurricane Matthew, the exact same hurricane, hit Haiti before it hit the US. And there, there were not 30 deaths. There were thousands of deaths. There were hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of homes destroyed. There was already a cholera epidemic in Haiti. And due to the massive flooding and water pollution and destruction of their public services, that cholera epidemic spread across the country like wildfire. So yes, they are not prepared. They do not have the ability to cope with these. There's no flood insurance. There's no FEMA. There's no National Guard. There's no bank account with a balance in it. There's nothing that would help people rebuild their lives. And there might not even be a public health system. So yes, that is why people who are already vulnerable today are even more vulnerable as a result of a changing climate. Thank you. All right. Um, I am not going to run for Congress because I'm not a U.S. citizen. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> um, and but that, I'm not going to. I'm not going to call that the real question. Um, do I? Oh, when, when dealing with people that fall into the doubtful category, do you find that they're doubtful about other science-related topics? That's a really good question. So my friend Ashley, the one who studied the Pope, right? She just published a study, and you know what that study was about? Flat Earthers. And she texted me over the weekend and she said, Catherine, how do you deal with this stuff? I said, you have to deal with it by laughing at it. Text me the worst emails that you got. So she did. And we laughed at them together. And then I texted her the worst comments I had gotten that day. There is some studies by um, Steve Lewandowski who looked at conspiratorial thinking and he showed that there are connections between people who say that people that the moon landing was fake that um, the earth is flat that the queen killed princess diana he lives in england <laughs> and that climate change isn't real but when people are more doubtful rather than dismissive it tends to be more a case of that's their political identity they don't really have a problem with basic science and technology because we all use it every day what they have a problem with is the fact that they've been told it's anti-conservative to care about a changing climate, when in fact, what's more conservative than caring about it, conserving our resources? So it really is an identity issue that is focused on very select issues, not broadly across the science. Question. Uh, I'm, I'm missing out on the jokes here. <laughs> oh, okay, governor. All right, governor. New Jersey or Texas? <laughs> Go ahead. Mm. Uh, my name is Serena. I'm a painting concentration at Mason Groves. Um, it's hard to not get so passionate sometimes with people who mm -hmm. are, as you say, dismissive. Um, my question is, is there some sort of exit strategy that you've devised to get out of a conversation that may be not getting so, per, you know, um, what's the word? Provoked. Yeah, yeah. Yes, right yes. Well, when it's, when it's a remote conversation, it's not so hard, but when it's in person, it definitely is challenging. So um, I had an experience, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a very specific conversation. Um, it was a man who, um, who had just found out that I was a climate scientist, and he was not happy about the fact that we went to the same church. So he came up to me after church, and he said, 
you know all that stuff is fake. And so I said to him, I said, no it isn't. And did you know that we have 30,000 jobs in the wind and solar energy industry in Texas? And he kind of looked at me, he's like, well, you know it's all the sun anyways, or so to speak. And then I said, no, we've looked at that. It's not the sun. And did you know that we already get almost 20% of our electricity from wind and solar energy? And per kilowatt hour, we get many more jobs than if we get it from natural gas. So we did one more round like this, and then he stopped and he looked at me and he said, why are you saying these things? <laughs> and I said, because those are the solutions. Do you have a problem with more jobs, with cleaner air and water, with investing in the local economy? He's like, no, but Obama's birth certificate was fake. <laughs> and he literally did say that. <laughs> and at that point, I just said, no, but we agree on the solutions. So we have to agree to disagree on the science because the solutions are really what matter. And we agree on that. And at that point, I just walked away. But that was the most extreme conversation that I can imagine. Yes. <laughs> I wasn't going to go into the birth certificate. <laughs> well, hang on a second just here. Let's see. What have we got here? Um, ooh, okay. How can the arts help us have these conversations? Yes. I hope that wasn't a double dip because you said you were in arts too. So my sister's an artist. Uh, I feel very passionate about the arts. What do arts do? They touch us in a different place. They don't touch our brain as much as they touch our heart. They get our emotions engaged. And so often the problem is... <laughs> <laughs> I need eyes in the back of my head for this. <laughs> when our emotions get engaged, we react very differently, and the arts are what enable us to engage our emotions. What do we most lack right now? We most lack a vision of a better future, and that's what gives us hope. What will give us a vision of a better future? It is not science. Trust me on that one. We can give you, especially with what Bob and I did together, we can give you the most horrifying vision of a future that you could ever possibly imagine and then some. We need a vision of a better future and that is what the arts can give us because we have to be able to move to something that we want. There's only so far that fear will get us. Mostly it will help us just run away from the bear or really actually just faster than the person beside us because that's all that matters because bears only eat one person. So the arts are really, really important. I'm glad you asked that question. Yes. Ah, research teacher environmental literacy. Oh, yeah. And so one of the things that I've found is if we look at non-formal educators that work outside of schools, mm -hmm. centers, museums, that type of thing, mm -hmm. they talk about environmental issues as an extension of who they are, what they believe, mm -hmm. and what their job is. But when you ask teachers about mm -hmm. discussing environmental issues, they're like, no, that's not my job. Mm -hmm. It's in the medical to what I do. And Interesting. so you know, since you've done all this research mm -hmm. on identity and, and pulled together some great research, hmm. do you have any thoughts on how to push those teachers gently into saying, yes, it's okay to discuss this issue that mm -hmm. isn't really an issue in something that's happening? That is a fascinating question. I have never heard that before, but it makes total sense. So, so what I would do is I would focus on having the conversations with a representative group of teachers and try to figure out what do they think their job is? What is their responsibility? What is their duty? What are their goals? And then from their own mouths, figure out which one connects directly to informing their students about the future of the planet. I'm pretty sure you could find one. Thank you. Thanks. All right, one more question here. Um, let's see, uh, what, are my, <laughs> what are my thoughts on the EPA? Very discouraged. <laughs> Try not to think about it. Um, oh, what's the proudest action you've taken to reduce? <laughs> I like that. Okay, so, so I got, this is not me. Um, for those of you who know me, who know my background a little bit, um, when, so when I, I'm Canadian, when I moved to the States, I was, so unaware that there were people who didn't think climate change was real, that my husband and I had been married about six months before we figured out we were on opposite sides of the page on this. We're now on the same side of the page, and for Christmas this year, he gave me solar panels. 
Yes, and not only that, he did all the work himself. He got everything, every T crossed, every I dotted, and he bought them from the company in San Antonio that I sometimes use in my talks as an example because they took in out of work oil patch workers who lost their job when the oil price fell and they trained them to do solar panel manufacturing. That was not my proudest moment. That was my, my husband's proudest moment. That was the best present ever in so many ways. But for me, I'm really satisfied by some of the small things I do, like the fact that in our house, there's a space for a, a, a freezer. But what does a freezer do? It encourages food waste. For me, at least personally, it does, because I freeze a lot of stuff and then we never eat it. So rather than have a freezer, which also uses electricity, I decided that, you know what, there's a grocery store on my way home from work, and I'm just going to make a commitment to stop there twice a week instead of once every two weeks like I used to. And then in that place where the freezer fits, I'm going to buy these drying racks on Amazon so I can hang up all our clothes to dry. Not a big deal, just a little thing, but it really, really worked. As a climate scientist, though, I have to say the biggest part of my carbon footprint is travel. And so what I have worked hardest at, and so maybe in this sense I am proudest of this, I have worked really, really hard to reduce my carbon footprint from travel. I still do fly. I'm super excited about the fact that they're starting to integrate biofuels into jet fuel because that does cut the carbon footprint. But when I fly, I collect my invitations. I work with awesome people like Bob, who works with my schedule so that I can do the Garden Club of America, meet with colleagues, give a briefing on the Hill, have lots of great research meetings today, give a seminar and a public talk, then go into New York tomorrow to do the CBS Morning Show, all in 48 hours. And that's the way I travel. <laughs> and then I sleep in between. Um, I've also transitioned over 75% of the talks I give to virtual talks. Often to organizations and people who say, we've never done one of those before. So that's what I try to do because I think it really is important to make a difference in our own lives so it gives us something to talk about as well. So I'm not just running around telling people, oh, we should fix the climate, but I'm not doing anything. We're all in this together. All right. Um, hi, my name is Sagar. I'm a polytechnic major. Um, so my question is actually kind of related to what you just said. Mm -hmm. Um, so what I identify as part of the problem is, um, so people who believe in global warming believe that's an, like, the alarm of people, mm -hmm. who believe that's actually an issue, um, they're really disenchanted by the government and that maybe yes. the government is not doing enough, mm -hmm. but at the same time, like, they don't think their own individual actions to reduce mm -hmm. their carbon footprints enough, so what, I guess, like, how much of a difference do you think an individual can make, and, like, how can you convince someone um, of, like, a tangible reason as to why they should make Yes, that's a great question. So some of the most important individual de decisions that we can make involve what I've talked about. Talking about it, joining an organization that shares our values, that helps us amplify our voice, and one of the most important actions that we can take individually to reduce our carbon footprint, depending on where we live, is vote. To quote Alan right here, it is better to change a politician than a light bulb. <laughs> <laughs> So there is a lot that we can do, and a lot of it involves getting together with people who are like-minded and working together to affect change, which is occurring. Um, businesses, cities, states, universities, tribes that represent over 40% of U.S. emissions are still in on the Paris Agreement. There are entire cities, like I said, like Dallas, of all places, Dallas people, oil, that are going carbon-free. So change is happening, and it is spreading across campuses, it's spreading across cities and states, and it's happening because of individuals. So, thank you. You get the last question. How can kids fight climate change? Oh! So, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you a secret. My, remember how I said I have these global weirding videos on YouTube that you can watch? They have cartoons in them, too. And I told people which ones were like the ones that most people watched, but my favorite one is called I'm Just a Kid, What Can I Do? And there are so many things you guys can do. So there's this girl who won the National Intel Science Fair because she grew algae biofuel under her bed. <laughs> yes. There are kids who are going on strike from school, not all the time, just one day with their mother's permission. They're going on strike from school to say, hey, you got to fix this thing for us. There are kids who are inventing little machines you can buy for $5 that actually you know, would charge your cell phone. 
Um, there are kids who are suing the federal government. They're actually suing the entire government of the United States to protect their future. So honestly, I am most encouraged by what kids are doing because you guys are awesome. So, thank you. <laughs>